happy Earth Day. And mm -hmm. thanks for spending your evening with us um, tonight. Uh, and with that, I'm going to tell you about Tim. He's pretty incredible. Tim Duclo holds a Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Biology from the University of Vermont and a Master of Science in Conservation Ecology from UMass Amherst. During his graduate studies, Tim served as a research fellow with the US Geological Survey's Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center and US Forest Service Northeast Research Center, publishing first ever evidence of the complex associations between climate, forests, and mountain bird communities in Northeastern US. Um, his focal areas are climate change ecology, forest ecology, land management, conservation planning, and even a bit of fisheries biology. And since 2018, Tim has served as the ecologist and conservation manager at Merck Forest and Farmland Center in Rupert, Vermont, where he leads and oversees ecological monitoring, forest and field management, recreational infrastructure, and a bit of environmental programming and community outreach. Um, Tim is a Vermont native, and recently he bought a home on 35 acres with his dog and field assistant rodeo <laughs> in nearby Dorset, Vermont. And he is yeah. loving stewarding his own lands in his, in his free time. And I, I can't imagine he has a lot of free time right now. But, um, yeah. and with that, Tim, take it away. And thank you so much for, for just joining us tonight and putting this presentation together for us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cal. Uh, you, uh, you hit it out of the park. So I appreciate that. And um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to partner with the Manchester Community Library and to, to host this talk in this way and all of you joining us on Earth Day. So I can't think of a, a better way to celebrate it than talking about birds, especially as, as spring is uh, upon us, right? So um, yeah, as Cal said, I've I plan to, to talk about 40, 45 minutes here, and then um, you know we'll we'll have a hopefully a good discussion afterwards. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into things here. If, uh, if if I wade into any technical territory, I'm going to leave it to Cal to like um, you know rein me back in maybe. But um, I, we already talked about no scientific names. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, without further ado, thank you for coming. Um, so in today's talk, um, we're going to talk about uh, just the basics of birding. You know, no doubt we've got some folks among us that um, have been birding for a while, but you know, I'm just going to start with the basics so that they're covered. Um, I'm then going to bridge into talking about just 10 of the most common backyard birds uh, as, as kind of the, the starter, starter pack, so to speak. We'll talk about uh, a little bit of their particular needs and uh, how to um, kind of attract them and maintain them in your, your yard. And from there, I'll talk about how to uh, contribute your observations to science and to, to engage in um, you know, a variety of different citizen science projects just uh, through observing and monitoring birds in your, your own backyard. So um, got a, a bit to go through and hopefully it's a, it's a good one for everybody. So starting with the basics, birding. It's basically, um, I mean, it's, it's what we all probably no doubt know what it is. It's, it's just going out and observing birds. Uh, you know, a lot of people take it as, as a hobby. Um, others, you know, um, well, it's no doubt a, a hobby across the spectrum, but I dare say it goes from, you know, very casual observations, um, be it, you know, from your own window in your backyard, um, you know, from, you know, the car at 60 miles an hour, um, hopefully keeping the eyes on the road, but, uh, you know, there's just always the jokes about um, birding <laughs> from the car, uh, all the way to the extreme where it's like, you know, some people are, are like listers where they're like, um, you know, they've got personal records and, you know, every year they're trying to get as many birds as they can. Um, you know, this, this movie that came out, uh, the big year, um, you know, what, like maybe, Eight years ago, kind of cap captures that that end of the spectrum quite well. Um, but uh, you know, today we're going to be focusing more on the the casual and just what you can do, you know, right from your couch, right from home. Um, it's kind of set the stage for like why birding matters. Um, 
it, it's a very popular uh, hobby or pastime. Um, you know, there's it's incredible what it actually does to the economy and what it does for conservation and environmental education. And 45 million people, you know, uh, estimated on average uh, bird watch in North, you know, US, in the US every year, bringing, you know, $80 billion from wildlife watching into the economy, a little less than half of that, no small number, $41 billion in just birding equipment and trips um, comes into the economy from birding. And that in turn creates a lot of job opportunities for folks, um, no doubt also including myself. You know, I think of birding as a really awesome way in which to like engage people in nature. Um, they're a very charismatic a group of species and um, you know, they're, they're highly visible. They change, they vary from season to season, from place to place. Um, and, you know, even myself, like if I was to go, you know, all the way to the West Coast, like I'd be in a position to see a whole bunch of different birds I've, I typically don't see. Um, and, uh, you know, as a scientist, as an ecologist, birds also tell a lot about the environment. So it's, it's definitely noteworthy um, that uh, birding and birds are really, really important. Um, to get into birding, uh, it, it really can be as simple as just like looking and listening, um, you know, using your own eyes and ears is, is the most foundational concept of, of it. Um, you know, from there, it really helps to have a pair of binoculars. Myself, I, I like to use um, uh, just a basic set of uh, Nikon Monarchs. These are just 8 by 42s um, you know, they're, they come out at about like 200 50 bucks or so. Um, but I know folks that will spend a lot more on, on glass and, and binoculars, um, but just a pair like this is a good way to go. Um, and then from there, just, you know, pen and paper and, and, you know, something to write down what you saw when you saw it, um, or even just like field notes on different characteristics of the bird that you're seeing and want to identify. In terms of bird guides, um, I know Cal has got quite the, the, the resource at the library. These are three of the guides that I have and go to and would definitely suggest. Um, they're all excellent and they have great visuals and great illustrations and you know, different keys to be able to um, you know, identify what you're seeing based upon you know, different characteristics of the birds and habitat and whatnot. Um, so these, these are the three I would suggest. It also is really helpful to be able to learn bird songs and bird calls just because birds are very vocal, especially during the, the, the summer, the spring and summer. And as I'll talk about in a moment, um, you know, aside from being able to see a bird, it really helps if you can hear it first. Um, and I would suggest picking up or, or acquiring uh, the Peterson's Field Guides Birding by Ear. Um, I've got CDs of, of this that I play in my car and it's, it's just, it's a really um, helpful way to kind of multitask as you're driving around to like listen to the bird calls, the bird songs. Um, I, speaking for myself I, and other people I know, I, even in every year, uh, it, it, it helps to kind of just revisit and relearn um, the basics of bird calls and bird songs. I also wanted to mention that you can kind of download and customize your own list um, for free from this website called Zeno Canto. Uh, and I'll, I'll, at the end of this, the presentation, like kind of present all these different websites and resources that I referenced today. And, um, you know, these resources are definitely really helpful. So we'll Give those out as as a, a PDF, perhaps via email after uh, after the talk. But Zeno Canto is is a website where folks can um, and do upload audio files of birds uh, from around the world, and so you can get all these um, for free audio files of different bird songs and calls. And it's it's an example of actually a, a citizen science project as well. Today I'm gonna pull a lot of material and reference very much uh, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. This website, allaboutbirds.org, is an amazing, amazing resource. And from there, from this website, you can access all kinds of different 
citizen science projects, as well as different resources, thinking about, um, you know, creating bird habitat in your backyard, what to feed different birds, what um, nest boxes and nest conditions you can provide for to attract individual birds. Here, uh, the allaboutbirds.org website, um, the Cornell's lab, lab of ornithologist website has uh, free identification information for um, all the birds. And so uh, I just wanted to throw that out there as like a really premier resource for folks to use. With smartphones and, and uh, you know, pocket computers, so to speak now, uh, there's also um, ever, you know, being developed like a whole suite of different apps and stuff that you can carry with you in the field. Uh, two that I wanted to, to throw out there um, as the top of the list today are the, um, you know, again, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's uh, Merlin app, which draws from, you know, citizen science observations through eBird, as well as all the resources that uh, Cornell has got to uh, give you custom lists and prompts on what you likely would be, could be seeing given what people have seen around you recently. Um, so it's, it's not just like a dictionary of birds, it's also like a dictionary of birds relevant to where you're at based upon what people are seeing around you. Um, and again, this is an example of like, uh, citizen science um, being put to use uh, to, to help people understand what's, what's, uh, what's going on around them. And this one is free, Merlin is free. Uh, LarkWire uh, costs a little bit, um, still pretty inexpensive. I've used LarkWire before and I like it because of uh, it's just helpful and, and fun quizzes. Um, so yeah, these are the two apps I would suggest. Beyond that, there's some basic tips for success um, when uh, birding. And uh, these are ones that I, I focus on and there's no doubt others, but uh, the first trick of the trade I would say is to, to look um, and focus on, on movement and not the bird necessarily. Uh, it's kind of like a, a classic um, birding um, scenario in which people are, are like, you know, one person in a group has seen a bird and everybody else is like, where's the bird? And it's like, well, the bird's in, in the tree right there, that tree, oh, which, you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, the nature of birds in general, especially during like the breeding season is they're, they're gonna be moving around uh, pretty readily and they're gonna be um, gleaning insects or grabbing insects off of branches and leaves and whatnot. Uh, they'll be defending their territories from other, other birds. And so they'll, they'll, they're actively moving around typically. So I definitely suggest just looking for movement and not the individual bird. From there, uh, as I mentioned previously, listening for that bird song or the bird call is really helpful as well. Um, it's helpful both to identify where the bird is at, but also um, it's, it's a good way in which to, to better, or it's another way to identify what the bird is because many of them have very distinct songs and calls. Um, the, the songs are much more noticeable and, and melodic, uh, whereas the calls are much more subtle and even experts struggle to differentiate individual calls. So typically when we're talking about like bird vocalizations, uh, singing is, is what most folks are, are kind of talking about. From there, just being still uh, is, is really helpful. So um, again, you know, like anything, you know, uh, moving around is, is uh, a disturbance to, to animals and birds especially, they're just very visual uh, creatures. So trying to minimize your movement is helpful. And then less patience and realizing that uh, birds often like keep to a territory and they, they, they can escape you, you know, they'll, they'll move off pretty quickly sometimes, but uh, in general, if you kind of stick to an area for, for a good, good enough amount of time, a bird will circle back. Um, but mm -hmm. overall, just being patient is really helpful. In terms of identifying birds, it's, it's helpful to, to key in on individual characteristics. Um, there's a lot of different elements uh, to a bird's body, and we're not, we're not going to go into that uh, 
today, but you know, maybe in, in part two, we can get more into the physiology and, and morphology of birds and whatnot. But in general, just like kind of keeping an eye on like the size of the bird, um, whether it's like, you know, a, a chickadee sized bird, so a smaller bird or, or you know, a little bit bigger, like a nuthatch or, you know, a, a, a robin, uh, you know, cardinal uh, blue jay size up to like, you know, turkey, just being able to identify like the general size of the bird is really a good way to start. Uh, from there, the general shape of the bird is, is typically unique or distinctive, especially the, the, the beak. Um, you know, the, the finches have like thicker beaks, whereas, you know, like the, the nut hatches have more pointed beaks and whatnot. It all depends on largely upon the, um, what the bird eats and how it's adapted for that that food. Um, so just kind of keying in on on that that shape is a big one. And the overall shape shape of the bird is also a helpful thing to to think about. Color birds are are generally pretty um, vibrant in their color, especially the males. Um, they're they're much more colorful because they're trying to attract females, whereas the females typically are are uh, much more drab. And that's, that's a term that, that birders will use to describe a bird that doesn't have a lot of color. Um, that's because the females are typically trying to be more cryptic and, and hide while they're on the nest and, and uh, it doesn't bode as well to be visible. Um, but anyhow, looking at the color is a big one. And then just the pattern overall, like, you know, if there's any unique wing bars or, um, you know, striations or patterns to the, the, the breast or the, um, the tail or the back, um, or, the, or especially around the eyes and the face. Uh, in general, these are all just different uh, levels of characteristics to key in on when you're, you're trying to kind of keep in mind uh, wh what a bird looked like um, in the moment so that you can identify it later if you don't have your book in front of you. And so from there, kind of jumping into uh, a couple, of, you know, 10 different species of birds that are uh, pretty frequent in folks' backyard. These, a lot of them are resident birds, so they're um, visible throughout the year. Um, it, it felt safe to, to kind of start with, with the basic birds. I mean, there's, there's you know, um, hundreds of, of birds in North America, different species and whatnot, but um, these 10 are kind of a good place to start. I would, I would say the, the black cap chickadee is probably the, one of the cutest and, and most noticeable of the birds. Um, you know, these, these guys and gals, they're here year round. This is uh, on each of these slides, you'll see a, a distribution map on the right here that I pulled from uh, Cornell's, Cornell's Lab of Ornithology's website that show the um, you know, the, the breeding, uh, kind of the range that that bird occupies, whether it's, you know, migratory or resident or, um, you know, kind of if those two ranges overlap, it'll show that as well. But with the chickadee here, you can see that it just um, generally stays the same latitude um, and doesn't undergo a major migration. On each of these slides, you also see some basic like natural history information for each each bird as well. Um, so specifically thinking about the habitat, um, you know, what it feeds on, whether it's like seeds or insects or nectar, um, its nesting habitat, uh, whether it's like in branches or, or in structures or in cavities. Um, and we'll talk about uh, cavity trees and structures a little bit as we go as well. Uh, and then, you know, just general foraging behavior and its conservation status. Um, with the black cap chickadee, these guys they um, you know readily occupy uh, fragmented habitats or you know ur urban suburban areas, uh, wooded areas as well. They're generalists, so they're all over the place. Um, you can easily attract them to your feeders uh, with some suet, sunflowers, peanuts. Um, you know, uh, well peanuts. I, I was surprised to read that on the, the Cornell's Lab of Ornithology's page because it's kind of like a big nut for a small bird. Um, but certainly like little little niger seeds are also like really suitable for these birds. Um, they do, uh, they are known to associate with willows and alders as well. So thinking about planting that around your yard it would no doubt be beneficial for these birds. 
And then it's notable that um, they, they can be sensitive to edges of habitats. So kind of where there's a transition between the forest and the um, kind of like the, let's say like a lawn or, or an open area. And so trying to place a nest box for them uh, a little bit further into the woods is, is a good way to go for these birds. And they, they are cavity nesters meaning they'll, they'll occupy um, like excavated spaces in dead trees, you know, typically from um, woodpeckers and whatnot, although chickadees will actually um, excavate their own cavities. So they'll, they'll uh, peck at that wood and pull it out until they, they've got like a, a place to nest. Um, and then I'm gonna go and try to see if this will work. I, I meant to try this with you, Cal, before we jumped on here, but uh, I've got the, the audio files linked up for each one. Oh, um, so fingers crossed, bear with me. <laughs> um, it should pop up and uh, play on my... Okay, we'll, we'll do that then. So from there, Northern Cardinal is the next one I wanted to talk about. Um, everybody can see the presentation, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so... The cardinals, aside from the, the chickadees, um, or with alongside the chickadee, I would say, are kind of the two heralds of spring. I, I think about, um, you know, when things start to warm up, or even before it warms up, kind of when, when uh, the day length hits a certain point um, in late February, early March, I'll start hearing the cardinals and the chickadees sing a lot more. And so it just seemed apt to, to mention that the cardinals. Uh, here, the, the cardinals have actually been kind of expanding north in their geographic range. Um, they do typically um, definitely occupy more uh, urban, suburban areas um, and not so much like into the deep hardwoods, but you know, I've got them here on Danby Mountain Road and, and uh, pretty much anywhere there's, there's houses and homes, you'd see the uh, Northern Cardinal. This uh, individual, um, this species, uh, the, the male and female do look different. And so here on the left, uh, the male is just strikingly, you know, crimson with, um, you know, that black face mask. And, and uh, here, you know, they're, they're uh, seed eaters. So they have like a really thick bill as well. Um, the female, she, she's got the crown and the, the mohawk, just, just like the male, um, but much more, again, drab, like the females typically are, are, are not as vibrant as the males. Um, they, they do like sunflower seeds. Uh, they can be bullies at the feeder for sure. Um, and kind of push away other birds, but not, not as much as blue jays, um, mm. but, uh, the, the cardinals, uh, definitely will come up to your feeder, um, in general bushes and kind of understory shrubs and whatnot, um, can, can promote nesting around the home. So <laughs> here I'm going to juggle again, perhaps if, if this works. Yeah. Folks hear that? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like spring to me, I'd say. Back to the presentation, right? Uh, hopefully here. Okay, so. Next up, we have our good old American Robin, another year-round resident for us here in uh, this latitude. Uh, they, they do move south out of you know, Canada and the, the tundra and whatnot. But um, you know, these are another herald of spring. Uh, you, you see them um, in big numbers in the wintertime, uh, but you know, as spring kind of uh, comes, comes along and, and all these birds start breeding and dividing into territories, they do kind of divide up. I've had robins running through the snow in my yard the last day, still no doubt looking for worms. They do love worms and um, healthy lawns, healthy soils. These are, a, um, this is a species that uh, can, can really be impacted by the use of pesticides in, in lawns and in gardens and whatnot, just because of their close connection to the, the ground and the earth. Um, they are generalists in terms of their nesting habits. They'll nest in a tree, they'll nest in a bush, 
and you no doubt will have them in your garage or in your awning or you know in your outdoor structures as well. Okay, let's do that. Folks hear that, right? Mm -hmm. So like a really vibrant flute, flutey. Mm. There's a couple other birds that sound like them. Maybe in part two, we can talk about some of the, the sound alikes. <laughs> Scarlet Tanger comes to mind. Um, it's the American Robin, okay. From there, uh, American Goldfinch is another one I wanted to highlight. Uh, these are another, this is another example of a um, year-round resident bird in this region. They do undergo a bit of, um, you know, a, a change in plumage from winter to, to summer uh, pretty soon, and you'll, you'll start seeing them much more, you know, uh, with their, their breeding plumage, uh, if not already, the, the males just get really, you know, go, look like this, very golden and um, striking, whereas the females kind of just look a, a little more, um, I just keep saying it, drab or not as, as vibrant as, as the male, especially not with that, um, you know, the back and the chest is as golden and, um, you know, the head not with that, that females don't have that black face. Immatures and the Im immature individuals in a lot of these species also look like the, the females. This is one that you can um, benefit with planting uh, thistles and milkweeds in particular in your yard or you know different varieties within that that um, genre so to speak. Uh, they, they will take to bird feeders um, sunflowers and niger um, seeds in, in particular. You often will see them kind of like below the bird feeder um, sifting through the, the stuff that gets kicked out by the other birds and it's notable that um, it, it's alongside uh, cleaning your bird feeder and uh, it, it's also nice to clean below the bird feeder as well for, for these, these birds as well as some of the other ones that kind of occupy the ground and, and forage around just because you can get a buildup of droppings and, and moldy seeds and stuff down there and it, it can definitely have an impact on them if, if, if it's not kept tidy. So, uh, and then this one sounds like this. It's kind of like a nasally pinched high pitched fat. I'll give it one more go. Yeah. And all these birds are gonna start vocalizing much more uh, as, as spring, for, you know, advances just because they're getting further and further into the, the breeding season and really the vocalization is, is you know, males in large part for most of these birds uh, defending territories and attracting females. Mm -hmm. The morning dove is another uh, tried and true backyard bird. This is probably the biggest bird so far that we've talked about. Um, they, they will take to shrubs and, and evergreens for nesting. This is a bird that likes platform feeders and kind of those, those more, um, you know, uh, they, they, they're a bigger bird, uh, a, a bit more, don't tell them I'm gonna say this, but clumsy bird. <laughs> so they do like to, to take to um, bigger platforms. Um, and they'll, they'll also, just like the goldfinch, they'll also forage on the ground and whatnot. So here again, it's, it's important to try to keep things tidy uh, below, below that feeder as well. Um, and uh, you can actually attract a breeding pair um, to, to nest in your yard if you put up a particular type of nesting structure called a, a nest cone. Um, I'll talk about cones and, and uh, birdhouses a little bit later, but again, you know, this is something that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has covered really well. And uh, they've got all kinds of information on exactly what a nesting cone for a morning dove uh, looks like. The morning dove gets their name because they sound like they're in mourning. It's not like morning, like the day. Yeah. 
Morning Dove. Yes, they get their name uh, for their mournful call, M-O-U-R. So next is, is very much a migrant. So this, this bird undergoes the biggest migration of the ones we're gonna talk about today. It's also a, an awesome one to have in your yard. This is the ruby-throated hummingbird. And it, uh, the male has this, I mean, true to its name, a very prominent ruby colored throat. The female uh, looks very similar, except she doesn't have that. They also have this green iridescent back. Um, they're a very small bird, the size of your thumb or thereabouts. Uh, they're also unique because they're uh, nectivorous. They eat, you know, consume nectar, right? So any, any tubular flowers that you can plant in your yard, um, in your garden is going to be a benefit to them. So flowers, it, awesome for this bird. Uh, they also take well to, you know, um, hummingbird feeders. Uh, and you can just give them like table sugar mixed with water um, in a particular um, combination and and they'll take to that. It is notable that you um, you best uh, kind of swap that water out at um, certain intervals and frequencies just because it, it can get kind of nasty and, and even potentially fermented and that's not good for the birds. Um, but uh, yeah, and then they, they do, you know, nest in trees and make these really super tiny cups. Um, if you've ever seen a hummingbird nest, um, it, uh, it's, it's an amazing sight to see. It is like everything miniaturized. Um, and this is what it sounds like. It, this is one that doesn't have like a true song, so to speak, or technically it's more of a call. And then also just that, that buzziness of um, them flying around is, is pretty notable. I get a kick out of this because it's like, you can tell this bird has had a lot of sugary something. Yeah, yeah. pretty amazing bird. Um, I, I've done a bit of banding in my time and uh, it's it's pretty incredible to have one in your hand. And um, there's, there's like a, a specialty hold that you use called a, a cigar hold. You kind of like hold them like little cigar, or little cigar birds. Um, I even had one land on my hand once out of nowhere. Like I, I was sitting on a porch um, at a field station and I saw one flying around and I was like, man, I feel like if I put my hand out, this bird will land on it. And I did, and it did. And it was like so, so special and odd. Um, they're, uh, I don't know, they're just really cool birds. Um, so yeah, it's the ruby throat hummingbird. Uh, another one of my favorite birds, uh, year-round resident here again, is the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, males look much like the female and vice versa, except the males just have much more of a, a dark crown um, than the female. These are uh, unique in that they uh, will go up and down a tree, um, even upside down. So they, they, they forage for insects in the cre crevices of the, the bark on a tree. Um, so they'll definitely benefit from any mature trees you have on the property, especially trees that are like kind of shaggy or have like deep crevices like ashes, um, for example, or like shag bark hickory and whatnot. Um, they will come to bird feeders, they'll eat large nuts, um, sunflower seeds and whatnot. They do consume suet, so if you put out a little suet feeder, they'll eat that. Um, and as I mentioned, they're just like shaggy bark. And they're also cavity nesters. So this is another bird that would benefit from having um, some dead trees, standing dead trees with cavities on your property. And it sounds like this. These guys have a, a cute sound too. It's the white breast in the hatch. So I'm seeing I'm taking plenty of your time right now. Hopefully folks are, are still holding on. <laughs> um, so moving on uh, from here, we've got uh, three more birds to go. So this is the, the hairy woodpecker. Um, I, I, the, it looks very much like the downy woodpecker. Notably, the, um, the, the bill is as long as the head. That's how I, I identify this bird. Um, I also kind of remember like, 
hair, head, bill, same length as head. That's that's how I remember the hairy versus the downy. Um, they look very similar, but the, the males has got the, the red um, cap here. And they'll, they'll come to suet, they'll come to, you know, seeds as well. And here again, they're cavity nesting trees, so dead trees, um, snags and, and whatnot are, are going to be a benefit to this guy as well. This is what it sounds like. So just a really sharp call. Yeah, they also uh, have a unique drum um, that they make as well when they're kind of uh, feeding on a tree or you know, digging into a tree. So again, uh, the downy woodpecker looks very similar to the hairy woodpecker, just a bit smaller. The bill isn't as long as the head. Um, the males just have uh, a red tuft at the back of their head versus the female. Pretty much the same requirements as the hairy, just in that they'll, you know, they, they love standing dead snags. They love, um, you know, gleaning and foraging for insects on, on mature trees. And their song is, or excuse me, their call is much like the, the hairy, but just much more um, subdued, I dare say, a little quieter. Cool, we'll give it one more. Right on. Uh, last one is uh, a Phoebe, Eastern Phoebe, uh, another herald of spring, one of the early migrants. Uh, I've been seeing some of these, these guys around, males and females look the same. Uh, they're very notable. They're a flycatcher. They're notable in that their tail like uh, bobs pretty regularly. So you'll see them often on like, you know, fence posts or on, um, you know, perched up and their tails just doing this. They, they like to nest in trees, but they'll nest in your house, or not in your house, but uh, in, your, in your garage and in your awnings and in your structures as well. Um, they, don't nest, they don't come very frequently, if ever, to feeders. Um, at least I don't recall seeing them very frequently. Um, but, uh, you know, anything you can do to promote insect diversity in your property is going to help them out. And uh, here's what their, their song sounds like. They pretty much say their name. So Phoebe, Phoebe. Yeah, I love these guys. Whoa. So moving on to thinking about like, you know, elements of habitat in your backyard. And we already kind of mentioned a lot of these things. Uh, in general, it's just, it's, it's, a benefit to have a really diverse um, environment in your backyard ecosystem. So specifically, things to promote are like those standing dead snags. Um, if, if you can, you know, it's understandable that they pose a hazard potentially to the house if it's too close. But in general, like, you know, standing dead trees are really good for birds, really good for, you know, as insect uh, food sources and then as uh, shelter and, and nesting sites. Um, I definitely promote thinking about, um, you know, retaining like understory and, and shrubs and growth um, within your forest and as well as shrubs around and in your yard. Um, here I'll, I'll pause and mention that it's, uh, it's important to think about invasive plants and avoiding some of the common invasive plants. I'm um, thinking like burning bush and um, honeysuckle as well as barberry. These have been commonly planted at homes and they actually do also like bear fruit and um, birds will eat that fruit, but there's actually some emerging uh, science that suggests that that kind of fruit from invasive plants is like junk food. It, it doesn't have the caloric like um, nutritional uh, benefits that you know, natural foods um, have. From there, just thinking about maintaining like a healthy, um, you know, leaf layer as well as like some ground cover, um, and you know, as, as nice as lawns are, and I've I've got a, a nice little lawn too, um, you know, steering away from like having just a, a large, you know, monoculture lawn and, and just having a lot of diversity in, in, in plants 
um, around your yard. That's just going to generally attract uh, different birds as well. Uh, you can put up nest boxes. Uh, you know, certain birds like the eastern bluebird are in decline in, in part because the, the nesting habitat that they've, they've historically had, and specifically here, like um, uh, old uh, fence posts and whatnot, are, are no longer in use. And so they're, they're kind of at a loss without that cavity. Um, and so there's a variety of different uh, styles and designs of blue, of, well, not just bluebird boxes, but all kinds of nesting boxes that you can put out for birds. And here again, I definitely suggest going to nestwatch.org where you can learn about um, one, con contributing your observations of, of nesting birds in these boxes um, from your property to science, but also learning about the, the design and placement of a whole variety of different nest boxes for birds. And I just mentioned this nestwatch.org. Um, and we'll, you know, Cal and I will send out a PDF, a document with um, all kinds of resources like this. But I definitely check this out. This website's got everything. It also goes hand in hand that um, the same exists for feeders. There's a whole array of different feeder designs out there, and they all speak differently to different birds. So again, you know, you think about like the platform feeder for the morning doves, you think about like, you know, um, a, a hummingbird feeder, you know, that feeds like liquid, um, you know, liquid nectar and whatnot. You think about like suet for, um, for uh, nut hatches and, and woodpeckers and whatnot. Um, there, there's a whole variety and you can match uh, the, the feeder to the bird based upon your interest and in what you have. And again, I direct people to go to feederwatch.org to, to check that out. Some, some real quick tips. Uh, in general, it's nice to keep your, your feeders uh, greater than three feet from your windows um, and that's to avoid window collisions. And I'll, I'll talk about, about that in a second. Um, it's also important to clean your, your feeders frequently. So they suggest like two, every two weeks to every, at least once a month, um, just to prevent build, build up of moldy uh, bird seed and uh, bird droppings and stuff um, because, you know, disease and, and viruses can be spread that way. And then I would also just note, beware of like Cooper's hawks and Merlins. Uh, there's certain predatory birds out there that will uh, definitely keep, not definitely, but can keep, key in on the fact that you're attracting uh, birds that they might want to eat to their feeder. Um, in which case, if you've got a bird of prey hangout, it's just, um, uh, you can just bring your feeder in and kind of, um, you know, stop that habit uh, for, for a time and it'll move on. And then given where we're at in Vermont or in the region, I definitely would be remiss not to mention bears and the potential that um, come springtime uh, and then throughout the, the summer and fall, when bears are active, bird feeders are a really attractive um, source of food for them. And you can get some, some un, un or really uh, uh, not great situations with, with bears and feeders. So just be aware of that. Um, and here again, Cornell's on it. There's, there's an actually a, a great resource here at feederwatch.org uh, for different types of feeders, as well as ways to contribute like what you're seeing at your feeder, um, your list of birds that occupy your feeders to, to science um, and monitor those birds. Window strikes are a hazard to birds for sure. Um, so this is one of the things I wanted to highlight, which is that um, you can avoid window strikes um, by putting up some kind of um, visual um, like uh, stickers or like some soap, just some soap residue or some sticks. Um, it can be just temporary for a time if, if there's like a problem during the summer. Um, basically birds just don't see the window and they want to fly through the house or maybe you've got like um, your, uh, your plants or whatnot on the other side and they're like, oh, there's, there's something to perch on the other side of that window and so they'll hit that window. But if you can just reduce the transparency of it, um, which is kind of counterintuitive, but uh, that, that'll help. And uh, millions of birds do die from window strikes. Uh, and, and a lot of them are like skyscrapers and whatnot, but um, certainly at home, it, it's, a, it, it, it's a problem. And then even worse is uh, outdoor cats. Um, 
it, you know, there are billions and billions and billions and billions of birds die every year um, just because of outdoor cats. Um, and and it's, it's often not well seen or understood. Um, you know, the, the very things that, uh, well, basically like, you know, everything you're trying to do to, to attract birds to your property um, can, can make for a really easy meal for, for cats and, and they'll definitely pick up on that. So um, it's, it's certainly advisable to keep cats indoors if you can. So this is a list of resources that I mentioned today um, and I'll send them out as I, I've mentioned a couple of times. Uh, the Cornell, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is really the way to go and, and you can access most, most of this just going to allaboutbirds.org and, and uh, searching from there. Two things I wanted to highlight as we're kind of finishing up here is that uh, at Merck Forest, we've got two events that um, is in the works. Uh, first, uh, May 8th, coming up real soon, is International Migratory Bird Day. And uh, the hope is that we can uh, get some folks to the property and, and do some, some birding and, and contribute some observations to eBird, uh, another citizen science project where you can just upload from your phone what you saw where. And that, that's uh, great data for me as a conservation manager at Merck Forest. It's great data for um, other birders that are curious on you know, what's out there, where. Um, and uh, beyond that, our third annual BioBlitz is going to be uh, at the end of July, so J July 24th, 25th. Um, and that's an awesome event where we, we've got a whole uh, suite of different workshops looking at amphibians, looking at uh, pollinators, looking at birds, looking at, uh, you know, mammals, uh, you name it. And so this year, uh, hopefully we'll, we're much further past COVID and, and everything, uh, such that we can, we can really hit the ground running, uh, again for a third year in a row. And, uh, so please just keep in mind, uh, MerckForest.org and, and Facebook and, and our page there for announcements on that. And with that, I just, I thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I thank you for Cal for this opportunity to, to, to partner with Merck Forest and present this. And I really went over my time, but hopefully it's worth it. And, uh, you yeah. know, please ask me anything you want. Um, and you can always just email me. It's tim at merckforest.org. So with that, I'm going to stop, stop talking now. <laughs> well, that was just so great. Thank you so much, Tim. I was jotting down questions, but now is the time if you want to put some questions in chat, please do. I want to ask you, um, you said pesticides are bad for birds. Does yeah. that include fertilizer if you're trying to, you know, put stuff to green up your lawn? That's a good question. Um, I didn't, haven't read anything about fertilizer, um, but certainly um, I, I would look into it. I'm sorry, I can't give you a substantive answer on that, but any, any artificial chemicals that you're adding to, to the environment certainly, you know, is, is uh, less than ideal, so to speak, just, just because it's, it's not natural. But um, I would, I would go to, you know, Cornell's website and, and search that question out. Okay. Yeah. And then I got to also ask this too. I've been told yeah. down here that you're supposed to paint your ceilings in your porches blue, Robin's egg blue, to discourage nesting. And I'm not sure what the thinking is around why you would want to do that. But have you heard that? Uh -huh. There's a lot of blue <laughs> in a lot of farmhouse porches. Mm. And I, I, thought I have not heard that. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like a, a, a physio, like a, a, from a bird's point of view, why that would deter them. Um, you know, birds see colors in a different spectrum than us. Uh, right. I, that's right. another, it's another one. I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, that's, and um, I, I, what else? I'm sorry. I don't want to take up everything, but people, oh. please, I'm, I, what else did I, oh, any of the feeders keep squirrels out? Any? Anyone? <laughs> uh, well, there there are um, you know certain feeders that are like uh, have gates that come down um, you know based upon weights. So there's like pressure uh, you know okay um, you know pressure plates on them. Um, other things you can do is add uh, like a cone below it so that they can't like mm -hmm. um, 
shimmy up the pole. Um, I've seen a really cool one that uh, I've seen is, is putting a slinky on the pole because the, <laughs> the squirrels will go, get up and then they'll, they'll hit the slinky and then they just slide down the slinky. Um, oh and so there, there's some really creative ways in which to deter squirrels from going onto the feeder. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try that, tr the, the slinky. That sounds good. Cause I have a lot of fat squirrels that <laughs> in my heart. Yeah. Um, with that, I, does anyone else want to um, put in another question? I mean, I could keep going. I just, I'm just so fascinated. It, there is a, mm. I, there are birds that are nesting right now. I mean, this, this mm -hmm. and, and, and where he, you hear the birds in the morning, it seems. And then they, eventually one day it just sort of stops. You don't hear it quite as much. What does that mean that they're, they're now nesting and they found yeah. the it's a It's a really good question. So, uh, it's, so our resident birds like the robins, uh, for example, uh, have an advantage over the migratory birds in that they can, um, you know, take advantage of these 70 degree days and, uh, you know, everything that happens from there uh, to, to start nesting early. And, you know, robins are an example um, in that way of a bird that will, a species that will nest up to three times a season. So they'll, they'll try, you know, um, and some of them will succeed to have, you know, three successful broods, you know, so that's, that's like 12 plus chicks, you know, typically three or four uh, chicks per, per, per nest. Um, and then to your second question, um, you know, May to June, birds are most very vocal, right? So they're, they're, they're defending territories, they're attracting mates, but then suddenly there is that drop off. And what that is, is that they're all sitting on nests and on eggs. And um, once you've got something to defend, that's, you know, once you've got chicks, they, they don't want to advertise where they're at. So they get really quiet. Okay. I do have a couple more questions here for you. Um, yeah. Roberta asks, due to climate change, are you seeing changes in the kinds of birds that are coming to Vermont? Yes. So in my life, um, you know, since I've really started watching birds, one, one comes to mind, uh, the red-bellied woodpecker, um, that this is a bird that I saw at my parents' feeder in Benson, Vermont, you know, when I was uh, starting out undergrad in 2005, um, and I noted it to my professor, and he's like, oh, that's an interesting one, and then just by the time I was getting out of school um, in four years, like, it was a bird that people were reporting across Vermont, um, and so there and then beyond that, like in general, yes, birds are moving up in latitude and further and further north as things have gotten warm. And, and it's very visible through the eBird data, right? So the citizen mm -hmm. science stuff is such a rich data set um, from which scientists are, are, are creating distribution maps and the, can, can show that these birds are moving north. So yes. All right, and that, I think this will be our last question. I, I want to make sure I got everyone. Um, yes, I think so. Okay, um, Martha asks, have you installed an, an a Marianne or an American Kestrel box at Merck? <laughs> I did, yes. Yeah, you noticed it off of the Old Town pasture. That was um, a gift actually from Jason Hill, who's a biologist at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Uh, he gave that to us um, as a thank you for participating in their their biathon the other year and uh i don't know if anybody's in it um martha have you seen anybody use it i haven't yet no yeah so we'll have to keep an eye out for it it's uh right as as you depart the farm up old town road and really start to like go up the hill it's like right there on the on the right um on the woods edge so oh. We'll look yeah. for it. it. Is it possible it takes a little while before they accept a, a place to nest? Like if you put something artificial up a yep. nest, do they watch it a couple of seasons or or if, if nobody in, installs themselves there, is it just not the right, something's not right about it, not the right height, not the right protection, you know? Uh, yeah, it could be both. Um, mm -hmm. You know, certainly, uh, you know, they have to find the, the box to begin with. So there's that element of discovery. And then, um, you know, from there, 
if if nobody's occupying it, it there's there's probably a reason and, and it's time to think about like site selection and and orientation and, and um maybe it's just uh the environment in which it is is not attractive to the bird for whatever reason just because they they perceive things different from us you know right right yeah yeah well with that i think we should say thank you what a wonderful, fascinating world, uh, you know, that's all around us in our, mm. you know, right in our backyards and, and everywhere. So we need to slow down and um, <laughs> write and look for movement <laughs> yep, yep, and record yep. what we see in our citizen yep. science and, um, and learn more. Please come visit the library. I'm going to see if maybe um, we can get some recommendations for some books to add to the collection in case we don't have everything. I think it would be really fun to listen to the audio that yeah. um, you recommended to the Peterson. So um, yeah. now is the time for us to get out really and, and enjoy their, their songs. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and go visit Merck because they were probably there in great abundance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you, Tim. Thank you for, <laughs> for this. This was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you all. This yeah. Thanks for coming. Awesome. Yeah, thank you everyone.